welcome to Chew On This. You are about to enter a discussion on how to actually live out faith in Christ in the reality of our messy lives. This discussion comes from our Wednesday night crew, the pastoral preaching notes, and the live large group discussion that these notes prompted. Something we like to call a community-based learning experience. Come on and chew on this with us. Contention. Contention means a heated disagreement or an assertion, especially one maintained inside an argument. It comes from the Latin word contendra, which means to strive with, which means to make great efforts to achieve or obtain. Contention. This is Pastor Orlean Hasseltine along with Pastor Robin Bjornson, and we both thank you so much for joining us for this week's discussion on Chew on This. This discussion was held live on Wednesday night, January 10th, 2024. The topic we are on in this series is cunning. We are now on the foundation in the Old Testament part one, The Battle Begins. I would encourage you to go to our website and access the preaching notes. And that would be available on realchurch.org forward slash Wednesday night. And you will find under week one, there is a new handout available that is an outline of that message, which is very helpful to hang learning upon. And there is also a handout for this week, week two, which once again is just very helpful with resources. But there is four pages for week two in the handout. And the fourth page we'll be referencing at the end of this podcast, which is the how to recognize, the how to of this, which both of us have found very helpful, the cheat sheet, if you will. So, oh yeah, that's right. That's right. Now I know what this is. That kind of encouragement that you have the ability to be able to do that. So I just want to let you know to go to the website, realchurch.org forward slash Wednesday night and Wednesday night crew, and you're going to find everything posted there. You may have access the podcast from there, but If you did, then you know what we're talking about. It's already there. It was really delightful going home uh, this last night and feeling that we had just eaten some steak and potatoes, that we have had this discussion that shouldn't be surprising to anybody because if you read scripture, you realize there's side A and side B. There's there's a, a, a disagreement. There's an argument. There's actually a battlefield going on in here. And... The first time you peruse through it and you start seeing weird supernatural things, you're like, okay, that was for then, this is now. And then you find out, well, no, that was for then and this is now is even more because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. So we created this, this, this message right here, The Battle Begins, to give an outline and a structure of places to hang that knowledge so you can see all the patterns the patterns that are just evident in scripture and that when we discover a pattern it is delightful because then we know oh we're going to see this again this is important to god this Mm -hmm. is a pattern it just develops things that work well for us we tend to repeat and that is all the way through through scripture we talked again about about cunning making sure we understand it was lovely i had a friend ask me or just inform me that when she heard of the title she thought oh we're going to be, be learning about evil and its source and all of that. And then she listened to the podcast from last week, week one. And she said, huh, I didn't realize I'm supposed to be cunning too. It's like, yeah, that is the beauty of the word because it covers all of that. And to have our, I don't know, our grown up mindset that, oh, this is for us. It is like realizing, oh, I got my driver's license. Here, here we're being prepared to get our spiritual driver's license mm-hmm. and recognizing, oh, stay off that road mm-hmm. or that one isn't any good. Mm-hmm. So there is this, understanding of oh it's just normal but if you've never heard it before it's a little weird it's like okay and it is so much fun standing with the crew on Wednesday night and you can just see the response to a statement made which comes because you know I have a great imagination and things just come out sometimes and I try to qualify them all that this is what I'm imagining and thinking when someone has never gone there right they have read something Mm -hmm. and they bypass it because they don't understand it they've read something and they understand it they don't think anymore about it all of that kind of stuff so it was really fun to watch once again some of the avenues that we travel down that just happen when it's live that aren't in the notes but they were contained in the experience and it was great to do that together as a community so what we again are going to start with genesis 1 1 the first five chapters of genesis are just filled with a structure that is repeated through the rest of scripture the first five books of the old testament the pentateuch is 
basically the pattern and mapping of human behavior. So it is amazing when you uh, start taking classes if that's something you're interested in and, and studying and going, uh, getting, a, spending more time learning the girth of it, mm -hmm. how things just really do repeat themselves. That's why it was really important that we begin here. And once again, we're back in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And just as a reminder, and we discussed it in week one, last week's podcast, that there are three spiritual kingdoms here on earth. There's our kingdom, which we were given at creation through the gift of free will. Once we're born, we have a kingdom created by our choices. And then the enemy has a kingdom that God, that's only allowed for a short time. And we talked about that structure in last week's podcast. And then God has a kingdom where he, pre he placed Christ as king. And it's interesting in John 4, 4, 1 John 4, 4, it says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. So here, John, Jesus' is very best friend here on the planet when he was here. Um, and I don't think they're related, but you never quite know, because as you do more research and you find out how many of the followers of Christ and the uh, disciples, how many of them were somehow connected together. And just reading this, that here he's saying, You have overcome them. Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So there was this encouragement that was very appropriate in that time frame mm -hmm. as well as this one. Mm -hmm. uh, don't get your undies in a wad because mm -hmm. it's weird. Supernatural till natural. We're supernatural beings having this very, very natural experience. But it's still freaky. And it should be. And I have toyed with the idea sometimes of asking to see more into the supernatural. And then I thought, no, I don't want to because I don't understand it all. And I don't like that wigged out feeling. <laughs> so, all right, this I want to understand mm -hmm. with John penned here. That, you know, don't freak out. You're of God, my, my little children. And you have overcome them. This is the process that Jesus bought for us, for us to experience. Right. Because he who is in you, not he who is with you, it's he who is in you, is greater than he who is in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, Genesis 1 all the way to Revelation 22 contains supernatural activity. The Bible can't exist without the supernatural activity. It's just there. And it, there's God doing, God helping, God teaching, God training, God loving, God do this, God do that. There's all of this. And yep, all of that is there, but it's all against a backdrop of contention, of this idea of, wait a minute, that wonderful word that we began the podcast with, that a heated disagreement, if you will, um, an argument that's maintained, especially in an assertion format, that this is the truth, <laughs> okay? So this idea of to make efforts to attain or achieve, this, all of that is going on from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 and everything that is contained in there in between. And that includes us in our time frame now, which is called the church age, all right? So here, there in Genesis 3, 14 through 15, this gives us an example, and we'll touch back with this in a little bit further into the podcast. And all of the verses I'm reading are out of the New King James Version. And in Genesis 3, 14 and 15, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And when it talks about the enemy's seed, it's not capitalized. But when he talks about Eve's seed, it is capitalized. And this is why. When we hear about the enemy's seed, it's described in the New Testament as this in John 8, 44. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. That's also referenced in Acts 13.10 and 1 John 3.8. So there is that. That is the seed of evil. Now, when we see the seed of Eve, this is what we normally think of. Isaiah 7.14 Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. Luke 1, 31 through 35 also states that in true time. Isaiah 7, 14, it is a prophecy. But in reality, it's more than that. And this was so much fun. This is a, a verse that we just need to write down and maybe repeat every week that it is just there because this is this is our reality because of this contention this is what Jesus's death burial and resurrection has bought back right this is where we live now in the church age 
Galatians 4, 4 through 7. Once again, Galatians 4, 4 through 7 says this. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Oh, that sounds amazing, Pastor O. Just <laughs> preach it, girl. Come on. Come on. And it is amazing. And we read it and we go, it's like, oh, no, 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 no. You read it, you tattoo this on your thigh. This is something that every day, it could be your memorized mantra when you look in the mirror and are brushing your teeth. Right, that kind of thing. Because here, this is what being a seed of Eve, this is what has happened because of Christ. This is the rest of the story, if you will. Mm -hmm. We are redeemed. I no longer have to pay the price for the sin that is inevitably going to be in my life. Because we will choose wrong. Mm -hmm. Hence, Jesus coming, his death, burial, and resurrection. That resurrection piece overcame death, which is the, the epiphany of evil. Uh, not the epiphany, the, the epicness of evil. It's not supposed to be like that. Man was not created to live forever, but he was created to live a very long, long time. But the flood changed everything in our society, in our ecosystem. So man doesn't live that long anymore. Because guess what? When we lived a really long, long time, we got ourselves into unbelievable places of evil and self-worship mm -hmm. and all of the evil that the enemy seed has let loose here on earth so this redemption we have been not just redeemed okay now you don't have to pay that consequence go play nice see ya no 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 after that the reason why that was done is god has this long-term goal you are my children. I want to be with you. So there is this adoption. It's like Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection made this freeway where we can go. Now we can be adopted as children, children of God. And we know this is happening because the Holy Spirit that was sent after Jesus ascended is here not just around us as he was in the Old Testament. He's actually inside of us. He has merged into our spirit, if you will. I know. If you haven't heard the supernatural speak before or some people entitle it spiritual speak. It's kind of weird, but I try to use just plain language because my brain needs that. Mm -hmm. So it, it just merged in. I mean, there is this amazing, the spirit of his son, the Holy Spirit goes into our hearts and it's crying out, Abba, Father, which, oh, that sounds really sweet. It's really hard to understand this because we haven't been raised in a Hebraic community, but that, in a Jewish community, that Abba, Father is not a phrase you'd ever say in public, I have read, because it is very, very intimate you would be considered very rude and crude to display that intimacy in public. Mm -hmm. That when Paul wrote this, when he put these words down, he knew people would react when it was read to them. Oh, he must be joking. Mm -hmm. There isn't any way. I would never deserve that. How could you say that? I would never deserve that. You're, you're being foolish. Oh, Paul, you wise one. All your studying has made you mad. And he is like slapping us. Oh, grow up. <laughs> He wants that intimacy with you, so accept it. And it is there because he goes on to write, you're no longer a slave, but a child or a son. And if you're a son, then you're an heir for crying out loud. You're going to inherit all this. It's in the contract. Sign with his blood. Do you realize that? Being a seed, a part of the seed and inheriting from the seed that was penned here in Genesis 3, that God's saying, oh, here comes the battle. Here's the contention. Here's the battlefield. It is now set. But... It's already been won. So we don't have to worry about it winning and losing. We just need to be smart. It's like, oh, I know what that is. Huh, I'm going to ignore that because that's just a booger being flung at me. Mm -hmm. So I love this focusing. We are the world's most exotic blended family. Right. And it mm -hmm. is all according to listed here, but what happened and listed so succinctly here in Galatians 4, 4 through 7. I enjoyed so much starting with that, writing it up on the whiteboard, giving people an opportunity to go back and look at it throughout the message. So I would encourage you here on the podcast to hit the pause button. Mm -hmm. Hit this pause button and go find your Bible, an actual paper once you can write in it. But you can do it on your phone. I realize you can make notes on there. I do it with other books. but And just look at it and start highlighting those words because we keep coming back to this. It's going to be a bedrock reality. Scripture is a bedrock reality. Exactly. And as you're going through this, Pastor O, it really strikes me that 
um, we've had this conversation about you know the business model of ministry the yep. yeah family more intimate model of ministry and the scripture really strikes me as I wonder but that since the fall we need jerk into a transactional relationship oh, yeah. with yeah. with That's God yeah. and what Paul is unpacking here is okay so you know that intimacy you know that sweetness when your little girl crawls up into your lap and whispers yeah. into your ear I'm yes. a father I mean um, that sort of sweetness that's who we get to serve. That's who wants a relationship with you. That's how close he wants to be with you. This is not transactional or yes. distance or separate yes. from you or anything yes. like that. Yes, yeah. This is that's yes. this is what he wants for you. This is the way he's making for you. Yes. And I like that because our human nature likes the transactional because we have more authority in it or right. power or, mm-hmm. or we don't have to be so vulnerable. vulnerable. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. Yes, the blended family. So there are supernatural laws governing natural, natural phenomena. There are supernatural laws governing, governing natural actions. Can we truly grasp this as a phenomena, that there are supernatural laws that govern natural actions? It is really hard to do. And the example of Adam and Eve prove it, right? In Colossians 2.15, This is something that Jesus has done for us. It says, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. That is exactly what, when you read through Isaiah, and you read his his prophecy in Isaiah 7, that is, it's not in Isaiah 7, it's in a different portion of Isaiah, but that is what he talks about, that Mm -hmm. the enemy has made a spectacle, and people look at him and go, who's that? What are you doing that? We will hit that verse later here in the podcast, Mm -hmm. because I know it's included in a format, one of the format charts that are available on these notes. If you go, (laughs) yeah, all right, I can't help it. (laughs) So here we're back to Genesis 1. We're going to do an overview of Genesis 1, an overview of Genesis 2, and then a little dance through Genesis 3, and that will bring us to the conclusion of this podcast. So let's begin. Here's the overview, Genesis 1. Hi, in the beginning, I'm God. Hello. All right. There are things that may have happened prior to this, but here in the beginning, there's God, period. And this, and God, this triune God, created heavens and earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face. I mean, it's this thing. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, all three of them. The Trinity is over there, okay? This whole thing is all there. They're all there. And then starting in verse 3, he says, let there be light. And there's your first day. So there is this going on. Let there be light, and there was light. And that was a first day. Uh, There was a first measurement of time, all right? And then he goes in and go down to verse 6. It says, uh, then God said, let there be a firmament. I like that. Firmament in the midst of the waters. Let's try and use the word firmament today and see what people do when we say that to them. <laughs> Talking about atmosphere, you know, there, there's this thing growing out of the midst of the water. So God created the atmosphere of the heavens. There's this growing and there's evening and morning. And then there was the second day. Okay. Firmament forecasters. Oh, yeah. It's, not, <laughs> it's not meteorologists. It's, it's, it's firmament, firmament forecasters. Firmamentation. Firmamentation. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Firmament <laughs> with an I, not an E. If you do F-E-R, you're going to get kombucha. Yeah. If you do F-I-R, you're going to get confusion. <laughs> All right. And then here we go. We're on the third day, and God makes the earth. Okay. Gather things around waters. Let things stay. Dry land appear. Ta-da. Earth. Evening, morning, third day. Then there is the fourth day, and here comes the sun. Da 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 da. And yes, there is the fourth day. Evening, morning, fourth day. Oh, and here comes the fifth day, and there are. Oh, we need something to play with. Let's make some aquatic animals, and then all of the things that fly in the air. I'm just putting it under the category of birds. I'm sure there's a species name for that, and I didn't take the time to find it, but they fly in the sky. Mm-hmm. So there's all that stuff. So evening and morning, and there is our fifth day. And then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind. And there are the earth animals. There's things on the earth. And God saw that it was good. And he's like, oh, there are earth animals. And then in verse 26, he goes, hey, let us, the Trinity, make man in our image, the Trinity, according to our likeness, the Trinity, and let them have them, plural, dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creepy thing, all the stuff we just made, they're going to have dominion. So God did that. He created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then he blessed them, and God said to them, 
be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over, and then he lists all the things that were just created. Then God saw everything he made, and it was very good, evening and morning, sixth day. So there is Genesis 1 in a nutshell. So this is going on, and it doesn't look like there's much contention yet, really, right? You know, there isn't much contention, so there's this. So now we want to get an idea of what happened in more detail. Genesis 1 is an outline. Genesis 2, it's a little more into the activity of human natural, human supernatural, supernatural God messing with the human, trying to figure that out, that relationship. And it's just crazy and weird and wonderful. It's interesting to watch when you read through Genesis 2 that you're noticing a, a, a place that's been created that is nourishing, there's freedom, there's vitality, it's, it's healthy. Noticing that God and man have conversations. Um, and God created this one species, this one thing called mankind to reflect his image. When he talks to man, it's a very personal conversation. All the, the original Hebrew that it was written in, Hebrew and Aramaic, that it was written in, it is using a lot of personal pronouns. There are these things. And it is given, all of the stuff that was created is given to mankind as a job. This thing called dominion. I'm giving you this. Now it's interesting, in Genesis 1, God is referred to as God. But in Genesis 2, it is more personal. It is Lord God, which is Yahweh God, much more personal. So we can tell we are now moving into the relationship piece. Here was the outline and the structure. And now we're moving into this different commentary, if you will. Genesis 2, 1 says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. So we had a party. <laughs> I'm sure there was a party. Look at that. This is amazing. Invite everyone to the museum to see what we have done. <laughs> One person. <laughs> hey, it gets really bad when you come come and attend Wednesday Night Crew on Wednesday night because this just grows throughout the message because it's just too much fun. All right, so this is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day the Lord God made the heaven, the earth and, and the heavens. So before any plant of the field was in the earth, before any herb, before anything had grown the Lord God had not caused it to rain so there is no rain the water comes up from inside underground and there was no man to till the ground ecosystem was being created but there is no mankind and then when God created man whatever he did when he took the dust to the ground the ground he did something that in verse 7 in chapter 2 that nothing else has this mm -hmm. he picked up that creation and he breathed into him a portion of himself yeah the breath of the breath of life mm -hmm. and man became a living being john 1 4 says in him meaning jesus was life man became this so there's all this creative activity going on and it's interesting because all the words used to, that talk about creation the creator is the noun attached to all these action verbs so they all talk about things that god can do and how he does them in Genesis 2, 8 through 14, it talks about the garden being planted. We call it the Garden of Eden because it says there, eastward in Eden. And that is somewhere they believe in modern-day Arabia. That's where it is. And then there's this river that goes out of Eden to water the garden. There's all of this set up and, and, and created. And then it says in Genesis 2, 15, Then the Lord God, that personal Yahweh God, put the man and put him in the Garden of Eden, to tend, T-E-N-D, and keep it. I'm going to, all this I created here, I'm going to take you, it's like playing with your Lego set, and I'm going to put you right here, little blocky man, put you right here with everything that I just made. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. Go gorge yourself, baby. Go enjoy. Go figure out what all these trees contain. But the tree of knowledge of good and evil no, you shall not eat that one. For in the day you eat of it, you shall, shall surely die. Warning, warning, Will Robinson, there we go. Mm -hmm. So you get all this is for you. Go enjoy and eat. Go, And the atmosphere is so pure. Things could just grow. There was no need to supplement with animal meat or protein, anything. All that kind of stuff that we know as normal life now came after the flood and the atmosphere changed. Right here in this, this orb of pureness, I can't even begin to imagine 
what Adam's seen and what, what that was like. Mm-hmm. And note that Eve is not taken out of Adam yet. She's not separated mm-hmm. from him or created. So here, basically, <laughs> Adam's charge is to be the park ranger type of thing mm-hmm. because he's not just told to tend it. He is told to keep it. Now, it's interesting because these two words mean his task is to till and to guard or his task is to cultivate and protect, to guard, to protect. I get the cultivate and till because I've gardened. I understand that. It's a big Midwestern hobby up here. A lot of people do that. Isn't there this feeling like, wait a minute, wait a minute. What'd you say? What's the guard and protect part for? Those are odd words to show up this early in the story. Mm -hmm. Hmm. It's interesting. The word till and cultivate is work. It's abad. It means to work. It's implying that you serve, you're enslaved, you're a bond, your husbandman, your husbandry. That whole mindset is contained in this word. You keep, you're a servant, you service, you bring to pass, that you be wrought, you're actually a worshiper. It, it means so many things. All of this, I want you to till and to cultivate. I want you, there's this action where you make it grow and you make it better and it is your job, mm-hmm. right? Well, then there is this thing called shamar. This is the weird one. And this is the best definition that makes my brain just popcorn. To hedge about as with thorns. Hey, Adam, you see this garden? I want you to hedge about it as with thorns. I want you to beware. I want you to be circumspect. I want you to guard. I want you to protect it. Take heed. Mark. Observe. Preserve. Watch. So the big question in my imagination is cultivate, I get, but protect. Protect from what? The big old dinosaurs, and yeah, I did dinosaur stomping. The dinosaurs walking around outside. I mean, what is the protect from? Genesis 2, 18 through 20. And the Lord God said, um, it's not good that man should be alone. Somewhere, I do not know the time span, different mm-hmm. things that I have read. I do not, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper comparable to him. And all the women in the room, when I said this, go, oh, here we go. It's like, oh, no, here we go. This is exciting. This is exciting. When I first began studying this and I, and I found and just studying Genesis because you, you do that in your theological studies because everything we go is back to these portions of scripture this word helper is really really weird because it's actually two words that's why you see it in a lot of, of versions of scripture as help meet not help mate ever but help meet because it's a weird one because it is translated ezer or ezer connecto my American translation of how they're pronounced <laughs> and it implies someone that the first part the easier implies someone who assists and encourages to support for what is lacking it's a word in the old testament used for god when he helps us or the holy spirit when the holy spirit assists us oh so the first part azer of helper that first part is like, oh, someone who assists, someone who sees what is lacking and stands in support or helps it develop. Mm -hmm. So really, you're a team. Okay, there's this going on, I'm a team. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. You might not want to do that because of, oh, don't forget about that type of thing, all right? But there's more to it, and this is the part that I think is just really intriguing. It is qualified by the word connecto, and that means to be plain or visible. Well, that don't sound no fun. <laughs> it's like, all right. But it's a noun. There's a noun that relates to being visibly, that you are seen and it's understood that you're an eminent person. So maybe instead of plain, it's evident. Evident. Okay. Yes. Like it visible, goes, yes, it is, yes, you're yes, seeing dis- it distinctiveness. Mm. So in other words, God made someone who's going to do what God does. God looks at the man and says, our relationship isn't all that he needs. We need to do something else here. We need to add to this. Mm -hmm. We need to Mm -hmm. remodel this working, Mm -hmm. remodel this creation setup Mm -hmm. here with mankind. So what we need to do is we're going to make, we're going to make this connector piece like two Legos that where one can support the other and assist and encourages just like God the Father was doing with Adam at this time. It wasn't 
in my imagination, it wasn't working. I don't know if this is where I've, I've read and, and heard some imaginative speaking on this that talks about this is probably where Adam grew discontent with his relationship with God. Mm. As he watched all the animals, they all had their kinds, their, their, their yes. tribe. Yeah. Adam had no tribe. Right. It was him. And I wonder, too, <clears throat> you know, the, the Trinity had fellowship mm-hmm. at mm-hmm. a level that was, yeah. n- there's, there's no match for this. Right. They are complete in and of themselves. Uh, there's no contention. There's always agreement. It's always love. It's always support. And <clears throat> Adam didn't have that. So I wonder if this was an opening uh, for yeah. the Godhead to say, we want you to experience yes. a unity similar to the unity that we enjoy within ourselves. Yes. So long-term goal is right there. Right. Yep. You know? But to start it with, we're going to take something out of you, yep. and it's going to be this. It's going to be what I've been trying to do with you, but it's going to be on a human level. Yeah. You need the natural of what the supernatural and natural we're doing. Mm-hmm. So God is making the natural part of his reflection. Mm-hmm. And you can go ahead, or lean at realchurch.org. That's fine. And you can disagree, but I know that I'm right. <laughs> Just so you know, I will hear you. But there is this need for community right. that we just give the finger to all the time in, in Western culture and It's disturbing the amount of individuals who live their life never knowing this supernatural experience because it seems too base, seems too normal, and maybe too intricate and too hard and too vulnerable. And here, he's designing us as community right here in this, but he's going to create the ability for a male and female to, for partners here, these, because he's taking this out and he's creating this, and this is what's healthy for you. And this is what I was doing with him, but now I, I know he needs one of his kind to work this in his life. So I love this idea of being a helper to match his eminence. D. Atkinson, in his uh, commentary, The Dawn of Creation, here on Genesis, he talks about, he puts this word eminence, the helper to match his eminence. It is like one who is like him, but like, opposite to him here's him and the opposite of and the other part of so he says it's really funny in his commentary he talks about it's so funny when people take this and use it as a weapon because it was designed as a completion of not just partnership man and wife that type of thing but the same process in a different format in community Mm -hmm. you you like you were saying the whole thing about how the trinity works together Mm -hmm. You got to get your head out of natural thinking and get into the supernatural or the spiritual thinking, mm-hmm. if you want to title it that. That all right. So, but he, but before he does all of this, he's like, okay, before we we make this counterpart, this helper to match his eminence, the other half of his eminence, all of the animals God gathered together, and they came by, and Adam got to eight to name them. And here is God teaching Adam how to run the garden. Mm -hmm. I want you to see all of the different kinds that you have. I want you to give them name. I want you to understand who they are and what they are. And I want you to give them a name. So there is all this going on. And in this process, Adam is claiming his authority of a dominion in the garden. He, He was given this authority to to tend and protect, to tend and guard, cultivate and guard. And now he's given this authority of being in charge of everything, of all of these animals. So there is this wonderful, sweet, almost easy to miss transaction of authority happening right here. So, but when that was all done, Adam noticed I'm all by myself. And I'm pretty sure Adam noticed it, noticed it. How could he not? But I have to wonder if God put went through this action with him so Adam would notice it, notice it, and then he would understand God's going to fix it. Mm-hmm. I'm going to, when you, when you come to a thing and you notice you have a need, this is where I come in. A need you can't fulfill, this is where I come in. I'm, I'm expecting you to have needs because you're children. All right? So how much time had passed between just God and Adam in the garden? I don't know. There's all of this. After everything was created, how much time did they play in there before the animals were named? I don't know. And I don't know if it's really pertinent that we know. Sometimes it's really good that we don't know because then we are reminded <laughs> we are not God, mm-hmm. as much as you want to try. So then he put Adam to sleep, 
and it was a very pristine garden, so there was no dirt. He didn't have to worry about anything. You know, he's the one who created all this. So mm -hmm. he put Adam down so he could whatever. And he took one of his ribs is what scripture calls it, but he took something out of Adam. And he closed up the flesh in its place. So he had surgery. I have to ask if there was a scar. Scar, yeah. I think, and maybe there would be. Mm -hmm. And it would be a beautiful thing. And he created woman. So man in Hebrew was called Ish, and woman is called Isha, which is important to note because something happens later in chapter 3 that changes that. So here, they're named that because they are exactly what God designed them to be. They are counterparts to one another. You can't separate them because without them being together, you're not going to get the whole supernatural experience and the natural experience that God intended. And when Adam seen her, he actually said, I'm Ish, and this has to be Isha, because we are connected this way. He totally understood it, because he just got done naming all the animals. I see what this is. I can't be without this. This is expected to keep us all sane, healthy, and and fulfilled, and it's an act of worship, and it is amazing to have all this, all this is going on. Who knows how long it took, but it ends here in verse 25 that says, and they were not ashamed. There's no fear, there's no condemnation, there's total freedom. There was no picking up the dust of the earth and creating woman because what was taken out of Adam was taken and created into her soul. It was in him, it's all part of him, it is all one. God didn't live in the garden with mankind. They seen him, it sounds like, once a day in the cool of the evening as we interpret scripture. So mankind, Adam and Eve, have had to live by God's instructions while God is not present, just like we do. They have to live by God's word, just like we do. Words sometimes that don't make human sense, just like we do. They had to keep away from that tree as an act of obedience, because God said so. Oh, you totally cracked us up last night when you called that the no-no tree. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, we had a no-no experience right before church last night with this cute, adorable little kid. And then I go, no, no, that's not, well, yeah. You must go find your family, little cutie pie. I wish she would have been familiar enough with me because I so bad wanted to kiss those chubby little cheeks. But, and that's what God does when he sees us. He's just like, oh, you are so cute. Yeah, the no-no tree. And we need to accept there are boundaries that come from the supernatural mm -hmm. that we will never understand here on earth. There are supernatural laws that don't make sense. Natural laws, praise God for scientists. But supernatural, it's like, nope, that is amazing. Uh, I just have to ask myself, do I trust you, God? So how much time has passed? I don't know. So we have a section of time. 1 John 2.16, it says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Let that be our foundation as we enter in Genesis 3. Here we go. <laughs> the serpent. Now I want you to know the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Okay. Why do we need to know that? Because he's in the garden. Why in the world is he in the garden, Pastor Robin? How did he get in there? Was he the thing to be protected against? Why were they speaking with him? And it seemed to be a normal practice. And where was God when all this was happening? A cunning truth. The snake doesn't appear as the devil. The voice of temptation does not sound like the voice of evil. He hides himself in the ordinary and the everyday, the ordinariness and the everydayness of a creature in the garden. Once again, quoting D. D. Atkinson in his commentary. That just really hit me. Believe it or not, evil does not have the voice of Darth Vader. It would be really helpful if you're, you know, that thing. I should have gotten the mask and spoken it right now. It's like, it would be helpful. Oh, clue, big clue, run. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we mm -hmm. don't. So here, there are one, two, three, four. Oh, I got to pull out the other thing. I numbered them on the handout. It's amazing what happens when you make the handout. You get extra things flying through your head. There are six things that mankind did in this process. That was really stupid. And yeah, appropriate word. All right. And then there are three basic things that the enemy did that are very, very 
easy to understand because it still happens today. So here we go. Here is the overview. This is part of us learning to be cunning. All right. So here, number one, human mistake number one. They stayed around or near the snake. They stayed around the source of evil. It's like, really? You're really going to do this? And then evil said to the woman, the serpent, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Emphasis on every, because that's a lie. So he's challenging their trust in God. Is that what God said? The second mistake they made is they listened to him. <laughs> it is interesting because what you do when you know something is wrong, you don't have to worry about being, being embarrassed or sh ashamed. What you need to do is get out of there, run, give it the finger and leave. I mean, you just you need to just get out of there. You need to, mm-hmm. And here, because they listened, they got this casting of doubt on God's intent for them. The thing, number one thing the enemy was doing was questioning God's word. Is that what God's word really says? Are you sure you have it right? How many commentaries have you read? Do you know how to read Hebrew and Greek? Do you know these things? The enemy does not deny the goodness of God. He just simply sows these really small, easy seeds to let in of mistrust. Kind of to tinge that, you know, if God did that, he would be a meanie. And God's not a meanie, so you must not understand it right. Challenging their trust in God by questioning God's word. And then the third mistake mankind made, the woman made, she actually replied back. Well, we may eat the fruit of the trees. And she was off a bit because what God said is you may freely eat of everything else in the garden. Just stay away from this one. But the fruit of the tree that's in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it. God never said anything about touching it. He said, stay away from it, period, lest you die. And that's not, that's not what he exactly said either. He said, you are going to certainly die if you do that. And it's interesting because when Eve responds, when she says God has said, she didn't use in chapter 2 the Lord God, Yahweh God, the personal one. She used the more formal one. I thought that was really a telltale sign of where she was at, of trying to sound wise in her own wisdom mm. instead of, no, Dad said run, so goodbye, we're mm -hmm. leaving. But no, she actually replied. They stuck around. <laughs> They stuck around. They engaged with an activity because then the serpent said, oh, you surely, you will surely not die. You will not surely die. Um, this is not that big of a deal as you are making it. You are overreacting. You don't understand your faith. He is challenging them to forget the supernatural contains truth we don't understand. The Lord God knows more. Surprise and understands more surprise than I ever could because he created us. I am a supernatural being, have a very temporary physical experience, but I'm not complete. I have not been completely supernatural. Life with him requires trust, participation, sharing, and experiencing. They have for Adam and Eve had been living this way for how long, and they had forgotten all this, and they are sitting here having this conversation, which seems to have a sense of repetitiveness. Hmm. They stuck around. Then, the enemy continues in Genesis 3-5. <laughs> the human couple, they considered what he said. He says, you know, God knows, and the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. But I don't think it came across that way. What I think he did is like, you know, Adam, you have had this conversation. Now, this is my imagination, all right? Somewhere prior Adam, you and I have had the conversation before. Well, you know, you named all the animals, so you kind of are like God here on this earth, right? Because there's that spirit God guy, whatever the supernatural God guy looks like, right? There's that thing, but but you're the ruler in this garden, right? This is 
this is your home. He gave it to you, so that's got to be your tree. All right? You, you need to know that. Um, if you were not the person in dominion here, he never would have given you the right to name all of us animals. I mean, I know that you have more authority than me. I mean, here. The, 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 you've got to, you're the big guy, right? So that tree is your, your tree, right? And if you eat it, you're going to actually just give you the stuff you need to know. It'll be contained in you, and you won't have to wait for God to show up once a day and give you instruction. And he'll probably be pleased with you for doing that. So they considered. Hmm. And then, uh huh. When Eve saw, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise. <laughs> First John 2.16 For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is, but is of this world. That's what happened to her. Indulgence. Desire for the better than, the more than, what God can give me. Knowledge. I'm going to be the best me I can be, and this is how I'm going to accomplish it. <laughs> Oh, man. Mm. And God was crying his eyes out watching this happen. Mm. She took the fruit and she ate. And then she turned around and handed it to her husband who was right next to her. And he ate. So if you're thinking this is just a woman experience having a conversation with the enemy. And she later goes and seduces her husband into joining her. You are wrong so wrong you are believing a lie a lie from the pit of hell remember what god created there this shared dominion mm -hmm. right they are the exact equals they are mutually prominent and he is there and the enemy's there and i have to wonder why was he the one who didn't do his job and allowed this familiarity to start and here the enemy comes and says, I want to satisfy this hunger you have. I, I, I want you to see this beautiful but desirable thing. And really, this is who you are. It's the completion of you. You're going to be like God, owner of all wisdom. And once they ate, their eyes of both of them were opened. So what in the world happened? And they knew that they're naked. There was shame, shame and fear. In Genesis 3, 7 through 8, we watch shame and fear overtake them. Because they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God. They hid them, hid themselves from the Lord God. That personal, not just God, the Lord God, the personal one. They hid themselves from Abba Father. The freedom of life in the garden and the authority in the garden shifted at this time. The, the authority they handed over to the dominion of the enemy. Because that's who they worshipped by taking a bite of that apple. And in Genesis 3, 9 through 11... The Lord God is calling Adam to say, hey, where are you, bud? And he says, oh, I heard your voice, and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself, me and the lady over here. We went and hid. And God knew what they had did, giving them an opportunity to understand. It's like, who, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? I have to wonder if right there if they would have said, we are sorry, I don't know, and there's still consequences, but I wonder, I don't know, but it doesn't, they didn't do that. The man goes, oh, that woman, that woman you gave to me. That's exactly what is written in scripture. She made me eat it. It's her fault. And then the Lord God said to him, what, is, what have you done? And she goes, you know, that serpent deceived me. It's his fault, and I ate it. So here, this is, there's a couple curses in this place, but there's no curse over the woman or over the man or curse for them, on them. There's a curse around them. So the Lord said to the serpent, this is a curse on the serpent. Because you've done this, you're cursed more than all cattle, more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. This is what we started with. And he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And to the woman he said, my darling... I'm going to greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception, and in pain you shall bring forth children. It wasn't supposed to hurt like it does. Anyone who is born a child understands that pain. And then there's going to be a thing. This is a natural consequence of what you did. Now that sin is here, 
there is a thing that's going to be infecting both you, you natural, supernatural be beings called human beings, mankind. There's this thing, and this is what it's going to look like in your life, all right? You're going to desire your husband. Your desire shall be for him, but his desire is going to be able to rule over you. It's not his prescription. It is a result of sin. Mm -hmm. This is naturally going to happen. So this idea of shared dominion becomes subordination. All the mutuality is now going to have to be fought for because it's not going to happen the way it was. This is not, to quote D. Atkinson again, this is not a divine prescription of what should be, but a description in the fallen world of what will be because of the choices they made. All right, and then to Adam he said, oh, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying, don't eat it. He didn't curse Adam, but he cursed the ground. The ground this work that you were doing to keep this garden, how easy it was, you know it, but now it's not going to be the same because now you're going to toil hard to make a living. All the days of your life are going to be set, spent trying to make a living and, and provide for your family. There's going to be thorns and thistles are going to bring forth. You're going to eat the herb of the, of the field. In the sweat of your face shall you eat your bread till you return to the ground. For It's from the ground. You were taken, bud. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Now, here is when Adam names his wife, not before this. He names her after the curse, after the consequence. I would love to have an in-depth discussion with people much smarter than myself on the why. Mm -hmm. I read through some commentary. I just, it's interesting where this falls. She is not Isha after this to him. He gives her a name. And it's interesting because the name she had before was intertwined with his identity they were intertwined so intertwined they yeah. just operated as one yeah. but now he's saying um, Adam called his wife a name Eve which means the mother of children basically he named her humanity's baby maker she hadn't even had a baby yet yep yep <laughs> that's what I mean time and everything I mean it's just intriguing and it's good our imagination because we know something happened but this is all we get and it, it covers the structural outline of it um, there's no longer this connection of being one there is this is and this is me seeing Adam stepping into it's all her fault and he truly believes it and will punish her for it God's saying I can't I can't stop this Human nature that has aligned with sin is going to want to continue to sin, and this is part of it. This is not supposed to be in your relationship, mm -hmm. but he's naturally going to see, and he's going to resent and blame it on you. He's not going to own his own his own involvement in the scenario about not keeping this place safe. So the process of temptation hasn't changed much at all. This process right here is repeated in the New Testament. This whole process. It's so funny. You could take this template and lay it right on top of the life of Christ, the temptation of Christ listed in Matthew 4, 1 through 11. You have to go read that and laugh and realize, oh, we have a pattern. We have a pattern. I know this. After all of this conversation, God the Father, the Lord God, clothes them, cares for them, and moves them out of the garden lest they eat of the tree that will make them live forever, the tree of life. They can't have that because we don't want them to live in this state forever. Right. We are now on plan B, mm -hmm. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. So here, as we close, I can develop my cunning by understanding the enemy's methodology. Number one, the dude dons a disguise and not going to look like what you think. He's an angel of light, according to 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. Something we would find acceptable. Underline that in your brain. Acceptable. All right. Step number two, he's going to outwit humanity through confusion and distortion. Been around a long time. Remember, he was an archangel and all his demons, they, they lived in that time before Genesis 1 or somewhere between Genesis 1, 1 and Genesis 1, 2. They are created beings that rebelled against God. All right. So they have a supernatural knowledge that we don't have. So he wants to outwit. He reinterprets scripture. He questions God's motives. He always appeals to our human nature. Second Corinthians 4.4, 4, the goddesses age have blinded the minds, all listed there. Step number three, he's going to redefine God to us. Oh, did God really say that? God wouldn't mean that. If he meant that, he would be a mean person. He's not mean. 
Oh, God would want you to have that. He's going to question God's character. He's going to question his character to you. Expect it. Step number four, he's going to reconstruct God's directives to you. Oh, you surely aren't going to not die. You're going to become something. In 1 John 5, 19, it talks about that we know we, that we are of God and the whole world is under the sway of the wicked one. The whole world is under his sway. It's to be expected. Don't be an idiot. The word used appropriately right here. Be ready to know it's going to happen. It's just there. But it's already won. You can just walk away from it. Do not listen. Do not hang around it. He reconstructs God's directives, and then he elevates the role of humanity to be like God. Isaiah 14, 12 through 15. I mentioned that mm -hmm. this is the one where we, we see how, how Jesus triumphed. This is the one that ends with that, that humanity is going to look at you in all your destitution. But in Isaiah 14, 12 through 15, it says this. The enemy is saying, I will ascend, I will rule, I will sit on God's throne. It's listed right there because it has already happened prior to Isaiah, but he's also talking about, in prophetic manner, Jesus being the completion of this contention, if you will. In closing, I would like to share this scripture verse. Second Chronicles 16.9 Lest we get all sphinctured up with all this stuff, because if this is the first time you're hearing stuff like this, you are going to be in crazy mode. I remember when I first heard it, it's like, oh boy, some people have a great imagination. <laughs> and now I get one. In Second Chronicles 16.9, there is this amazing verse that shows the heart of God that for me just brings comfort in all of the stuff I learned that I'm not sure where to put it. Because I know I'm a supernatural being having this temporary physical experience. But it says, for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Embrace that. Thanks for joining us and listening in on this week's episode of Chew on This. We'd love to have you come and be with us on Wednesday night, the whole Wednesday night crew, to enjoy this discussion live here at our Forest Lake campus, and that's at 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday evenings. Please go check out all of the resources um, on our website, realchurch.org forward slash Wednesday night, and you're going to find a great resource of uh, archive to play around in. And a parting thought, as we're all learning to put missional living into practice, let's remember this simplicity today, wherever we find ourselves. Let's love God and love people. See you for the next Chew on this episode.